Hi, PJ Scott here with a really special edition of Veterans Forum. Folks, you've seen me in the past talk to Secretary of Veterans Affairs, Anthony Presepi, and Governor Locke, and a whole host of wonderful veterans. Well, as I have a world-renowned author, screenwriter, winner of the Golden Globe, and yes, a sailor. And take a look. Keep guessing. Get that VCR going. Yeah, the author of The Last Detail, Daryl Ponison, my guest. Gee, thanks for joining us today on Veterans Forum. What a treat. My pleasure to be here. Now, Daryl, I always start off with a little bio, and you've got a really interesting life. Tell us, where where do you come from? Where were you born in your family life before you joined the Navy? Yeah, I, I uh, was born and raised in a uh, coal mining town in northeast Pennsylvania called Shenandoah. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, went to local schools and uh, lived for a while uh, over the over the mountain in a farming community called Wintown. Now, was your father a farmer or a coal miner? No, mine? My, my father uh, had an auto parts store oh, in, okay. in town. Uh -huh. I've been there for years and years. Uh -huh. No, was your father in the military? No. No, my brother was. My brother was uh, in the Air Force. And, uh -huh. and uh, you know, starting with our generation, my father was second uh, generation American. Uh -huh. And told me he was too young for one war and too old for the other one. So, right, right. Uh, but uh, the generation that followed, um, it was just assumed that you would put a hitch in the military. Right. Everybody did. Right. That was the way it was, yeah. 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 So what made you to, now, you got college before you went into the service. Now, how did a boy from a coal mining community get to college? Well, it, uh, it was a lot easier, I think, in those days. Um, uh, not so much attention was paid to SATs and, and, and that sort of thing. More attention was paid to recommendations. And I was the kind of student who uh, who should be doing better, showed mm -hmm. promise of doing better. Uh -huh. And my teacher said that. I got uh, into a, uh, a a small liberal arts college called Muhlenberg, mm -hmm. Allentown, Pennsylvania, and uh, uh, got my bachelor's and went right into graduate school at Cornell. Now, when did you sense or have a desire? to write and knew that that might be something you'd want to pursue. Was that early on when you were a boy? I can't, I can't remember when I didn't feel that way. Oh, uh, okay. When, when, I was, uh, when I was seven or eight, I would write stories and take them up and down Main Street <laughs> and read them to the local merchants. <laughs> oh, and, and okay. And they're all scary stories. And they, they used to love to see me come around. Oh, okay. So, okay. Were coming so they thought you were going to be Stephen King, huh? So, so yeah, all right. So once I finally did publish uh, a book, everybody said, oh, yeah, I always knew that would happen. Okay, so you were the John Walton Jr. of a younger yeah, generation. Yeah, in a way. You uh, always uh, had, okay. Yeah, I wrote, a, I wrote a play in high school that they produced and that uh -huh. sort of thing. And uh -huh. Always, uh, you know, as part of the literary magazine. Uh, uh -huh. So you finished and you got your degree. Mm -hmm. And then with the degree and this obviously bubbling up with... Uh, a talent for writing and storytelling, how did you find yourself in the U.S. Navy? Well, um, I was, as a young man, I was, I was uh, both patriotic and, right. and, and uh, religious. Uh -huh. uh, uh, a lot of that has gone through uh, certain evolutions. But the, right. at that time, I was uh, in graduate school at Cornell. I had been teaching high school, and oh. we were on the eve of the uh, showdown, the Soviet show, showdown uh, over the Cuban blockade, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Right, right. And uh, I joined, uh -huh. just like just like people joined after Pearl Harbor. Uh, when when this happened, uh, I knew it was going to be a, a, a Navy war. Uh huh. And uh, I was in boot camp. By the time they actually came nose to nose, and, and none of us knew. Oh, so you really didn't wait long. You saw it coming, and you just went yeah. down. And Uncle Sam, yeah. here I am in this man's navy. And uh, and and my company there uh, uh, kept wondering, what's the status? What's mm -hmm. happening? You know? uh -huh. And we finally found out that the Russians blinked. Now I'm kind of curious because I was on the West Coast in elementary school when that happened, and I can remember 
having to get under your desk and put your hands under your head. And I had a hard time looking at the map. This little old Cuba over here in Florida could possibly have something that would hit uh, Santa Clara Valley in California. Yeah. Did you have those kinds of no, drills? No, well, I was, I was, I was growing up, uh, mm -hmm. and and I just uh, at the time I thought this is the end of the world. Mm -hmm. It really did. It was just. Uh -huh. It was the. It was the. Uh, the uh, most severe moment of crisis, I think, that uh, that this country has ever lived through in terms of actually getting to the brink of nuclear war. Right. Very scary. And Very there's scary. Lots of movies you can watch about that. And so I've since been to Cuba. I've been to Cuba maybe three times. Once at Guantanamo and then uh -huh. and, and twice as a as a licensed traveler uh -huh. uh, in Cuba. And, uh, Did I'm you quite, enjoy uh, it? Uh, very much, uh -huh. very much. Uh -huh. But that's a, another subject. Yeah. Now, uh, where did you go to boot camp? Where uh, did I send you? Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. And as I said, that was November. I guess that would have been November of 62. Uh, Sounds was about right. November of 62. Mm -hmm. And was there during the dead of winter. Uh, November, December, and January, uh, and it was uh, it was a real test of s surviving. Uh, uh, my son showed up there in February and got double pneumonia. Yeah. What about you? Well, everybody had pneumonia <laughs> there. We all had walking pneumonia uh -huh. or worse, uh -huh. uh, but nobody wanted to go to sick bay because it meant you'd have to start over again. You right. Know, if you had to go, if yes. you had to spend any time in sick bay. Right. So we all kind of uh, you know uh, machoed it out. Well, the women were forced to do the same thing in '72. You had to march over out to use. And in those days, it was it was a longer boot camp. I I was talking to some before we came on, and I think he said it was ten weeks or something. I believe so. And we were there for 88 days, which is 11 and a half, 12 weeks. Now, how did your folks feel about you joining the military after all that education? They were ambivalent about it, because I was I was older. I was 24, so even in boot camp, I was the old man. Oh, Most okay. of these guys were 17, 18, right, 19. Right, right. And uh, they were uh, ambivalent about it, but, uh, you know, what are you going to do? Now, in the college education, why didn't you become an officer? Wasn't quick enough for I, you? I, I, I actually did uh, look into it very briefly, uh, but I, I'm colorblind, and they told me that's it oh. as far as being a line officer, and I didn't care to be a staff officer, so I, I enlisted. Well, what rate did you get shoved into? I was uh, I was a yeoman. Uh, oh! And when I, <laughs> yeah, I'm a yeoman too. When, okay. I, uh, when I when I got an early out, and I was I was almost sorely tempted to stay in a little mm -hmm. longer because I just passed the. Uh, Test for a second class, oh, uh -huh. and I wanted to wear that uh, that Chevron. Well, I wore it for you, huh? Thank you. <laughs> so I, I was third class when I left. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, I think most of my audience, those of you who have read the book, the last detail, was this published in seventy two or seventy? Seventy. Okay. And this is this is a republication to to coincide with my new book. And many people, I think probably more people watch movies. Then they maybe read books, but it was a great. Well, I got entered. I read the book after I saw the movie, because mm -hmm. I was pretty in dating at the time, and some sailor who had other things on his mind took <laughs> me to see the movie. But uh, if you recall, Jack Nicholson played the title uh, character, and Randy Quaid was the poor schmuck that took got caught taking forty dollars. Yeah, I should probably mention what the for those who haven't read it. Uh, it's a story about yeah, tell it's us. a story about two uh, two first class petty officers in transit mm -hmm. at Norfolk who are assigned temporary duty as chasers to escort this kid from uh, Norfolk to uh, the brig in Portsmouth, New mm -hmm. Hampshire. And uh, they see this as pretty good duty, mm -hmm. uh, something to do, get off the base for a while. Uh, and then they find out that the kid was sentenced to uh, eight years for stealing forty dollars from the to, PX. Now uh, I need to ask: Is this based on any true story? It is. Oh it Lord! Is. Okay, because I remember thinking eight, eight uh, years for forty thousand bucks seemed well, really if extreme. You, if, you, if you remember the Uniform Code of Military Justice, uh, most penalties are as a court martial shall direct. Uh -huh. So in this particular case, the kid stole the 40 bucks from a uh, charity uh, box that was the project of the old man's old lady. Yeah, not a good and way to steal. Not a good way. <laughs> and uh, as you know, uh, a captain in the Navy uh, mm. is, is God. Or next door to it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
So, uh, but they questioned it. They questioned how uh, how he could get such a bad rap, and then they found out that he he, he had a good case as a, a kleptomaniac. Uh -huh. Let's give him screw it up. Right, right. And they looked at each other and said, uh, "We have to show him a good time." Right, you know, right. Uh, let's, uh, uh, let's. He was take a rather dumb and, and naive character, naive. but lovable. You couldn't help but care about the character. And that was the story. Let's let's try and show him a good time. And, mm -hmm. and uh, now, was this your first? published novel because I know you've written many. What do you have about 10 or 12 under your belt? Uh, somewhere around there. That, uh -huh. that was the first. Yeah. This was a... Oh, your folks must have just been bursting with pride. Your first novel and it just woo skyrocketed. You, you don't understand. <laughs> I, I was I was born in a place uh, of a generation where, where my folks did the best they could to discourage me, you know, because they didn't oh. want me having a big head. Oh, okay. So uh, my mother's comment on the book was, I like the cover. <laughs> She, she didn't like the language. She thought. Oh uh, well. I had to explain to her that sailors, when they're on their own, sometimes use salty language. Right. My father was a, a bit more supporting. I think. I mm -hmm. think he was. He was kind of proud. Mm -hmm. Well, good, good, and it became a wonderful movie. And were you nominated that? or anything on this particular book? Uh, I did not do the screenplay. The, the, uh, the, adapt, the adapter, uh, uh, a writer named Robert Town, was nominated for screenplay. Oh, okay. Jack Nicholson was nominated for the uh, Best Actor, Randy Quaid for Supporting Actor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I loved the book and I, and I loved the movie. Now, between these two books, now this is Last Flag, Flying. That's a sequel. This is a sequel, and it was like, it was a wonderful, wonderful read because it felt like I was reading a really long letter catching up with really old friends. But before we jump into that, because this is your most recent one, uh, tell us about some of these other books you've written. Well, this, uh, I, I wrote a book called Andotian PA, which was pretty much a, a, a fictitious account of the town I grew up in. Mm -hmm. And when this came out, my parents thought they were going to have to leave town. Oh, they seriously okay. considered leaving town. And uh, two or three years later, the town named me the Man of the Year and gave me the key to the Oh, city. wonderful. So were they so, afraid it was going to be like a Peyton Place novel, they, all the dirty uh, linen? Well, <laughs> actually, after, when they read it, they thought, we have to leave town. Uh -huh. Because I was too close to uh, uh -huh. a lot of the characters there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, then, and then they wound up being interviewed by all the papers, and they got over that. Oh, okay. So when the light was shined on them yeah. in a pleasant way, that was right. a very rewarding right. experience for them. Now, before we get too much further, we do have a picture, and I'm going to hold it up here for a while, of you and your uniform. And what a handsome guy you are. Tell us about well, the Or at least was. Huh? <laughs> I, I was the most beautiful woman 30 years ago. You wouldn't believe it. <laughs> but tell us uh, what's what's going on here in the photo because you obviously are with some buddies. Well, here. it's 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 marked January of '63, is it or '64? Oh, I'm uh, legally blind. You tell oh, me. Oh, yeah, I think it's, it's uh, January of '64, <laughs> and I believe we were in Puerto Rico. Uh huh. Uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, uh, having uh, liberty because we used to we used to take Marines down to Vegas, where they would blast up that island. Uh, oh, uh -huh. they're not allowed to anymore. They right. finally decided they had enough of that. But that used to be uh, one of our regular routines. Mm -hmm. And while they were blasting up the island, we'd go to San Juan, mm -hmm. which was a uh, wonderful liberty. The best best fried chicken I ever had in my life was in San Juan. Really, the yeah. best fried best chicken. Best fried chicken. Have you so been in the style? <laughs> yes, I am. Yeah, there was still. <laughs> and we used to go to we used to go to our first stop was at Trader Vic's, and we'd get uh, and, and the drinks there were terribly expensive. They were mm -hmm. like maybe two dollars a piece, uh -huh. but they were these big drinks with umbrellas, and we'd uh -huh. get one of those. Well, when you look back at your Navy, Tom, you were just in three years. Is it pleasant memories or? It's very pleasant now. Uh -huh. I mean, at the time, it uh, you know, uh, I think most people enjoy their service years. Uh, long after they've served them. Well, I have to admit, exactly. I don't know about you, but I ran into my fair share of, shall we call them jerks? Hey. <laughs> That's putting it mildly. Uh, those in the military know what I'm talking about. But you meet a wide range of people, but by and large, looking back, I yeah, I don't regret going in. I don't regret yeah. going in for a minute. I was I, able to get my college education because I went in, actually I signed up before I was 18 and they had to have me redo it because I wanted the college education. I wanted those 
benefits to go to college, and I did accomplish that. Well, they didn't waste any benefits on me. I already had my college, and right. I was very close to a master's degree. Mm -hmm. But I've, I've said in past interviews that uh, the Navy was my real education. Mm -hmm. I mean, that I, I finally had something to write about. Well, uh, obviously. So the characters in the last detail were these. Uh, Real people, or you combined it, different personality yeah. aspects into one person. I combined uh, from various guys I knew. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not, not, not one of them is closely drawn on a, on a prototype. Uh huh. Okay. Now, what? Uh, let's go through some of your other books here, and then we well, got to jump into okay. the last. Okay. This, this, I just, um, I, I, I picked up a couple of these as uh, I mm -hmm. came over. This, this was the ringmaster. I went off, and oh, I should show you this picture. I went off and uh, around. Uh, traveled with a circus, a uh, three-ring tented circus. Yeah, what did you do then? Uh, in the uh, season of 76. I remember because it was the bicentennial. Oh, okay. And, uh, and in the circus, I, I went there as an observer. I was doing uh -huh. research. Uh -huh. I'd rented a, a small RV. But on a circus lot, everybody winds up doing everything. Uh -huh. So eventually I became a clown. Oh, and, and performed okay. with the circus. And what encouraged you yeah. to do that? Uh, I was writing. Actually, I was writing this book. Oh, okay. This is a this is a uh, uh, biographical novel of the Western film star Tom Mix, silent oh, okay. film star. Right, right. And part of his life was with a three ring circus, much oh, like this one. Okay. And so okay. I, I I went with the circus for just a weekend to research it for that book, and and just thought, boy, this is a fertile soil mm -hmm. for uh, for drama. Right. And then I decided to spend a whole season with him. Wow. Wow. And the result was that one. Okay. Well, I guess that paid off for you in more ways than one, huh? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, I know you've won a lot of awards and such, and we don't want to forget that not only did The Last Detail become a very popular movie, but you wrote a book called Cinderella Liberty. You want to give us a brief uh, synopsis I of that? I should have bought a copy of that. Well, that was also a movie, and those of you who need a kind of little key, it had James Caan and uh, Marsha Mason, and that too was about a sailor. Mm -hmm. and, was, and that was written uh, in response to the last detail. Uh, a few years later, I'd written two books in between, but I, uh, it's hard to believe now, but in 1970, uh, I got so much heat for the language uh, in that book. And the movie itself was delayed mm -hmm. a couple years because of the language. The studio wanted to soften the language, and, and the writers said, no, mm -hmm. we wouldn't do it. The filmmaker said no. Mm -hmm. So as a response to that, I thought, uh, you know, not every sailor uses foul language. I right. know some that didn't. And, and no. I, I'm going to write a book about a sailor that not only doesn't use bad language, he can't abide oh, bad okay. language. Oh, okay, right. And that was the that was the, uh, the the impetus for Cinderella Liberty, but that is based on on a natural event that occurred to me, where I was sent to the hospital oh, okay. for surgery, a naval hospital in Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the eve of the surgery, they found out I didn't need it. And so by that time, my ship had already left for the Mediterranean, and he said it's going to take seven days to process you out of here. So for seven days I was in the hospital, nothing wrong with me. They gave me liberty at night, mm -hmm. but I'd be back by 12 o'clock. Right, so right. Liberty. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I just hung around for a, a week playing Monopoly and uh, uh, going out on liberty and staggering in at 12 right. o'clock and finding right. my bed in the ward. And I thought, what would happen if they lost my records? Oh. Entirely. <laughs> Would I serve out my time in the hospital? Right. For the rest right. Of and that was uh, that was the story in in Cinderella. Right. They lose his records. Well, I can tell you that uh, they do lose your records because when I uh, years after I was discharged in '79, put in for disability compensation, <laughs> they lost my record. So it was that's a well, long story. After, but yeah, they lose after, record. <laughs> after the book I heard from any number of people who said that's my story. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Now let's you got an award for uh, Cinderella Liberty, the Golden Globe, is that correct? I was nominated for a <clears throat> for a Golden Globe, yes. Uh -huh. Marsha Marsha won it that uh -huh. year. Uh huh. 
and uh, that year also I won the uh, NAACP Image Award. Mm -hmm. I was uh, the first and I think the only Caucasian to ever win that award. Really? Right, was right that because here. maybe you showed a, a, well, I don't know if I want to say totally gritty, but a more realistic, I mean, there are mixed race children, and I don't know that that was always considered polite to discuss previous mm -hmm. to that book, the movie, and there it was. I mean, this is, this is reality. Yeah, I think that was the reason. That was uh -huh. the reason that, that, that uh, a, a black kid could be part of the, of this reconstituted family, which is mm -hmm. you know, a white couple, and uh, right. I think that was the reason. Possibly. Well, yeah. what that's that's really a, a big award to be the only Caucasian. Yeah, race race figures in in uh, actually most of my books. I think it's one of the uh, ongoing abiding issues in America. Mm -hmm. So I try to uh, deal deal with it in some way uh, in, in all three of the Navy books. Aren't I? Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's jump to Last Flag Flying, which as I mentioned earlier is the same characters in the last detail. What? I'm so glad you wrote it, but I have to ask what prompted you to bring these characters back to the forefront. Well, I, I really had no intention to, but I, I had a friend who was, was such a fan of The Last Detail, he kept urging me to do it. And, uh -huh. I, and I said, I don't think it's a good idea. Uh -huh. And he kept after me, and, and as he kept after me, this, this Iraq war uh -huh. uh, kept heating up and spinning out of control. And I started uh -huh. thinking, how would my guys deal with this? Uh -huh. And, um, and you know, um, in the last detail, uh, uh, I guess I would be giving it away, uh, so I, I better not. Uh, uh, I was just going to talk about one of the characters, but I, uh -huh. I don't want to give it away. You'll see. Right. If you read both of them, you'll see how I handle it. Right. But there were a lot of reasons not to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, the, the reason to do it was post-9-11 America mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, uh, post-9-11 politics and, and the war in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just looked at my characters again and thought, what would, what would take them on that journey they took so long before, right. if they were to retrace their steps? Right. And uh, the reason they do is the, uh, the boy who served eight years in the brig got out of the brig and wound up working in a Navy PX, uh -huh. which is, by the way, why he wound up in the brig in the first place, right. as a civilian worker. Uh -huh. And uh, his son joins the Marines and is killed in Vietnam. No, no, killed. I'm yeah. sorry, I'm sorry, what a slip. <laughs> what a slip. Over both the Vietnam generation. Uh, yeah, wow. you, yeah. you know, uh, uh, let's get back to that in a minute because, well, I'll, I'll do it now. I mean, um, I, I, started, I started feeling and hearing so many echoes from Vietnam. Uh, you can insist Iraq is, is much different than Vietnam, but a quagmire is a quagmire. Right. And when I hear, if you'll remember from Vietnam, and you're probably too young, but the catchphrase was, uh, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. I, For years. I, yes, we I, I remember We were seeing the light that, at the yeah. end. And now, it's, uh, the insurgency is in its last throes. Uh-huh. You know, you can't help. And uh, it used and, to be. And Nixon it used to had be a in, secret in, plan. A remember secret plan. That, right? And <laughs> in, in Vietnam, we, we have to fight communism there or we'll be fighting on the beaches of Malibu. Right. Now it's we fight terrorists there so we don't have to fight them at home. Well, that's the premise. So yeah. I started seeing, my God, we're, we're back in that same situation we were in uh -huh. 35 years ago. Right. right. And so uh, uh, the journey this time is. Um, they have to go with their friend to bury his son. Mm -hmm. And they wind up uh, tracing the same path they took before. Now, I wondered when I was reading The Last Flag why it was such a pleasure to get a signed copy. Um, how many times do all of us, because Meadows was spending a lot of those eight years thinking about the two friends that showed him a good time before he went to jail, and his thoughts were nothing like the actual reality. And I'm not going to go into the reality. Read, read the book. 
But I thought, you know, that's happened to me where I thought about someone or something and just assumed that it would go this way. And then years later or months later, I find it's kind of like a psychological whiplash. Uh-uh, it didn't work out that way at all. Yeah. Did that have a, a, was that drawn from a personal experience in your life? No, I think that's just the way, the way things work out when you, when you fantasize people you knew briefly but intensely mm -hmm. and you haven't seen them for many many years you, you you put them in the element in which you last saw them right and these guys were proud 4.0 sailors right so uh, uh, our guy in the brig always imagined them that way mm -hmm. standing inspection on a ship and, and going on liberty and, and the truth was uh, far different Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the two had never seen each other again, never saw each other after that detail. Now, uh, Last Flag Flying, is it out at the bookstores now? It uh, should be by the time uh, this airs. It's on the internet, uh, Amazon, Barnes and & Noble, and, uh, and uh, it's certainly your bookstore can order it if they don't have it in stock. Well, I would encourage you to get this book, but frankly, if you don't know about the last detail, this isn't going to make Maybe quite as much sense. Well, I think it's. I think you'll enjoy it more if you read the last detail. But I, I tried to make it stand on its own. Right. Yes. Yes. A wonderful read. Wonderful read. I really encourage you uh, to read the book. Uh, it was wonderful. Uh, but of course, I'm a big fan of the last detail, so I really enjoyed it. Well, I think we've about come to the end of our time. I want to thank you so much for being a guest on uh, Veterans Forum. And pleasure. as a Navy wave, I'm glad to talk to a, a male yeoman. <laughs> thank you so much, and get the book. It's a great read. God bless you, and remember, we're still at war, so continue praying for our troops, for their safety and protection, and continue to pray that our political leaders would be led down the right trail. See you next time. <laughs>